Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for tuning in today. I am Jason Honor, the Archives and Museum Specialist at Martin Guitar, live from Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And I have a very special guest with me today, Kylan Reese. Uh, Kylan is a historian, writer, and master craftsman. And we want to talk to you about the origins of the Dreadnought. So Kylan, if you could uh, introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background. Sure. Good morning, Jason. I'm here in Kailua on the island of Oahu. And I've been out here in Hawaii for the last uh, two decades building and restoring uh, acoustic stringed instruments and playing my uh, prized 1946 Martin D-18 in my uh, uh, blue, longest running bluegrass band here in Hawaii. So that's my background. And over the last several years, I've uh, just delved deep into Hawaiian music history and founded a nonprofit organization uh, named in honor of Makia Kalakai. Uh, the Kalakai Center for Pacific Strings. And I'm honored to be here with you today and talking about Martin guitars and Hawaiian music. And what we really want to get into today is the origins of the Dreadnought. So in 2016, right. Martin Guitar celebrated uh, the 100th anniversary of the Dreadnought model. And uh, there was the Ballad of the Dreadnought documentary that the company made, and it touched on uh, Makia Kialakai and some of his importance, but the work that you've been doing has really come to show just how important he was and how important Hawaiian music is to the development of popular, popular music as we know it. And right. before we get any further, I just want to let everybody know that we will have a uh, live Q&A session after we're done. So if you can think of anything uh, while we're going through the show, please submit it to us. And uh, let's just get on and talk about Makia Kialakai. So Kylan, why yeah. was Makia so important to Martin Guitar? Well, it's it's a pretty fascinating story, and the, the research we've been doing has really uh, reframed Honolulu, um, the capital city of the Kingdom of Hawaii, as a really thriving cosmopolitan music epicenter in the Western Hemisphere in the 19th century. So Makia was born um, 1867 in uh, October 15th, and he was born into a neighborhood on the waterfront of the harbor side there that they had vaudeville music, opera music happening, um, minstrel troops coming through, playing banjo, mandolin, fiddle, accordion. Um, and of course, the Royal Hawaiian Band, the brass band of the, of the royal family, playing uh, the music of Bach and Verdi and Strauss. Uh, so he grew up in an incredibly vibrant you know, musical community. Um, interestingly, he was born the same year as Scott Joplin and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous architect. And, and he, you know, over the course of his life, he would really have an impact um, similar to both of those men, but his story has really been under celebrated, I, I feel. Um, and and Makia was singular in also that he, he was mentored by the, the last king and queen of Hawaii, King Kalakaua and Queen Liliuokalani. Um, he had a personal relationship with both of them uh, where he was studying traditional Hawaiian um, song structures and styles. And in, in Hawaiian culture, the, the tradition of composing songs is a very, very highly respected art form. Um, and Makia, by about age 23, had been tasked with composing the um, memorial song for King Kalakaua when he passed away. So um, as Hawaiian musicians started moving around the world at the dawn of the 20th century, uh, Makia was already a seasoned veteran of the Royal Hawaiian Band, a multi-instrumentalist, a virtuoso flautist, as well as a um, personal childhood friend of Joseph Kekuku, the inventor of the Hawaiian slide style of playing. So between Makia and Joseph Kakuku, they, they really uh, redefine the way a guitar could be played. And that's where Martin yeah. Guitar comes into the equation. Because right. Makia, you know, you, Makia was on the vaudeville circuit and traveling throughout the country. And 
I mean, back then there was no uh, amplification. You're lucky, I mean, microphones really weren't around. And so he needed the most volume he could get. And exactly. that's where he turned to Martin Guitar. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, Jason, by the time the, um, the first extra large jumbo guitar was made by the Martin Company um, and called the K. Alakai model in honor of Mejia, um, Mejia had been playing Martin guitars for 30 years. Um, in the kingdom of Hawaii, Mejia's childhood home was around the corner from the, the uh, Martin dealership. <laughs> if you can imagine, in 18, Ber uh, yeah, 1896, music. the Bergstrom Music Company um, would have been, you know, regular stomping grounds for uh, young Mejia. And all of Mejia's mentors, um, the kings and queens and princes of Hawaii, all played Martin guitars. Um, so when Mejia was on the vaudeville circuit in the 19 teens, going from Chicago to Indianapolis, Buffalo down into New York City, uh, playing concert halls where he was crossing paths with people like Sergei Rachmaninoff, you know, um, playing to thousands of people without the aid of amplification. Um, I think as, as Chris Martin says, the dreadnought extra large Kealakai model ensured that the person at the back of the concert hall got their money's worth. <laughs> And if we go back to company records, we can see the sale of that first Kealakai guitar on uh, March 16th, I mean, March 25th of 1916. Right. And I mean, that's one of the, the great things about CF Martin and Company is uh, the records that we still have intact. And we can go back and see significant instruments and when they were sold and who they were sent to. And we could see that this guitar was sold to Makia in Chicago right. on March 25th, 1916. It's, you know, I've, I've been really lucky to, um, to have access to your guys' archives, which I think a lot of people maybe don't realize. The Martin Guitar Company archives span three centuries at this point, um, from the earliest origins in Prussia uh, all the way through to the current day. And what that what that provides for researchers and historians and students of, of American music history is basically a map to show not only um, how the designs were evolving and the, and the stringed instruments that the Martin Company was collaborating with people to design were changing, but also how the, the musical styles were changing. Um, and so, you know, for in regards to Hawaiian music history, the, uh, the Martin archives have been really eye-opening into the amount of collaboration between musicians um, from the Kingdom of Hawaii and then the territory of Hawaii and then the state of Hawaii all the way, th you know, across the continental United States to uh, Nazareth, Pennsylvania and the family of the Martin Company. Now, can you explain the connection between New York City and Makia and then the Ditson Company? Sure. So the, the, um, the Hawaiian string bands really became a sensation. You know, Makia ended up on the West Coast in about 1905, 1906, and he was touring up and down the West Coast between Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles, San Francisco. And in 1915, the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco kicked Hawaiian music's popularity into high gear. People like Henry Ford and Thomas Edison uh, went nuts for uh, Hawaiian music. And let me see. And so by the time uh, Mejia had ended up on the vaudeville circuit between Chicago and New York um, in 1901, 1902, he was establishing um, a, a, a route. Can you guys hear me now? Is that better audio? Yeah, you're coming through, Kylan. OK. Um, you know, at the Buffalo World's Fair in 1901, Mejia and his orchestra kind of stole the show. And they started working the vaudeville circuit down to Buffalo, New York. And New York City really became a hub for these Hawaiian string bands that were um, performing really nonstop. And uh, of course, in New York City, uh, the Ditson Company and their agent, Harry Hunt, were um, right on the ground, you know, working with these musicians, talking about what they needed, uh, what ideas they had, and 
Mikia in about nine, from about 1911 to 1915 was playing a 0030 size Martin guitar that had been repaired at the Martin factory. Um, and it was, you know, that's a pretty small uh, guitar for playing concerts to a thousand people at a time. Uh, so I think between conversations between Harry Hunt, the Ditson company and Frank Henry Martin, they started discussing how to make a pow more powerful, louder uh, projecting instrument. And that was the birth of the K, K model. Now you've done some work uh, recently with the Bishop Museum in Hawaii. The exhibit is uh, set to close soon, uh, but can you explain to us how that came into fruition and uh, all the effort that you put into it? Yes, this is um, this is a pretty historic exhibition here in Hawaii. Um, I pitched this idea of the Bishop Museum. The Bishop is kind of like the it's like the Smithsonian of Hawaii, if you can imagine, the oldest cultural and historical. Uh, museum founded by members of the royal family in the 19th century. And in my research with uh, you guys at the Martin Archives and this community here, this different story of, of the influence of Hawaiian musicians really became clear to me. And I proposed an exhibition about four years ago and, and they immediately saw the value of it and we began putting it together. And We've been able to include um, instruments owned by the Hawaiian monarchs, um, the members of the Sons of Hawaii, the 1970s Hawaiian Renaissance um, musicians who really returned attention to this earlier style of string band music that, he, that had evolved in the Hawaiian kingdom. And of course, we're also including uh, Johnny Cash's D21 Martin guitar, uh, the Kalakai reproduction that the Martin Company made last year. Um, Ledward Ka'apana's, if fans of slack key guitar surely know Ledward Ka'apana, the guitar he grew up playing as a child in uh, the Big Island of Hawaii is a Martin guitar. Um, and so this exhibition is really, it's, it's returned focus to not only the instruments that grew out of the Hawaiian music community, but also the string ensemble style that, it, you know, by the turn of the last century was really predicting what was going to happen in uh, what we now think of as country or, or jazz or bluegrass um, American music traditional styles and it's up for one more week it closes on the 31st if anybody's in Honolulu <laughs> now uh, we see a photo of Vince Gill with one of the custom shop model K guitars right so the custom shop built two of those instruments uh, one is in the Bishop Museum in Hawaii and the other one you are uh, kind of, it's on a tour of the United States right now, correct? That's right. I'm, I'm really thrilled. That guitar, um, I stopped in at George Grun's shop um, last year during NAM when we were all uh, in in Nashville with the Martin Company, and he got really interested in the story and the history of this this Kalakai model, and I've I've been working on a documentary film. And so under COVID, of course, you know, it's very difficult to fly to the continental United States and, and do film shoots. So I decided to send this guitar on a journey re retracing Makia's steps, um, you know, over 100 years ago. And along the way, the guitar is meeting up with different musicians. It's been in Nashville with, um, as, as the photo shows, uh, Vince Gill, Steve Earle stopped by. Um, Jerry Douglas is going to stop by and play this Kalakai model as was originally intended as a lap steel guitar. Um, and then after that, the guitar is going to move on to New York City and then across the continent of the United States, ending up in California and meeting up with people like Peter Rowan and Dan Crary and all kinds of all kinds of folks. And it's really interesting because this guitar kind of returns our attention to a time in American music before everything was so genre specific, you know, mm -hmm. before there was this kind of music and that kind of music. It was just pretty much, you know, good music and, and there was guitar music. And um, it's interesting to return uh, our memory to that time. So now let's talk a bit about Martin Guitar's involvement with Makia Kialakai and that Model K guitar. Uh, we know Makia, he wanted uh, a larger guitar because he was on the vaudeville circuit so that he could right. be heard. And, and based off of that, Martin gets into building the Dreadnought for the Ditson Company. 
Right. So here we have Harry Hunt from Ditson, Frank Henry Martin, who was running the uh, Martin Guitar Company at the time, and then J John Dykeman, who was the factory foreman. Right. You know, Dykeman's story is really fascinating. Uh, Dykeman was born in 1893. Um, and so by the time he was a young man working at the Martin Company, he was um, a violinist and also a flautist. And those two instruments in the traditional Hawaiian string ensemble style that had really formed in the 1870s, um, before people were playing slide Hawaiian guitar, it was the flute and the violin that were really taking the melody in those string ensembles. So I think for a young man like John Dykeman um, in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, he was, you know, a renaissance, you can, from research that we've done, we can tell he was a very renaissance kind of man. He was building instruments, he was studying music. Um, and in 1917, he ran across a Hawaiian string ensemble in um, Easton, Pennsylvania. And through research, we've pieced together that the band that he saw, Charlie Clark's Royal Hawaiians, were actually members of Makia's um, band that Makia had been playing with on the West Coast uh, for many, many years. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Dykeman heard that band and went back to the factory and, and within a month or so, I think, Jason, he had he had designed his own mm -hmm. uh, proto proto model um, jumbo Kaalakai dreadnought guitar. And that guitar still exists. It's it's um, it's complete with the, the wider waist and the really unique Kaalakai bridge that we'll have a photograph of here in a little bit. Yeah, I know uh, that bridge was one of the most co complex aspects that we ran into when replicating the original Kaalakai models. Right. I, I, I'm so thankful you guys were willing to tackle that bridge. It's, it's a bear of a bridge. <laughs> well, let's, we're going to listen to a sample of what John Dykeman heard. And it's interesting because the, what was the theater in Easton is now the Sigel Museum. Right. Uh, so we can get that clip going and we can kind of hear, you know, what John Dykeman probably fell in love with when he heard this Hawaiian band. And this recording is of the original K model recorded in, in New York in 1918. Thank you. 
and part of part of what's been interesting with the research through the nonprofit is really trying to understand what Hawaiian music sounded like to people at the time. Because now we're so used to, um, you know, string bands playing this um, ensemble kind of style of music. But at the time, this Hawaiian music was really stepping into very classical um, musical communities, and it sounded, you know, probably close to what. Um, punk rock sounds like for a lot of people today it was <laughs> radical <laughs> yeah and when i listen to that i can hear that slide playing i can hear the influence of that slide playing on uh players from the mississippi delta like sure. I'm, I'm a big fan of robert johnson and early muddy waters and you can kind of hear the influence on that, on them coming from hawaiian music you know the amount of people who were influenced by these hawaiian string bands is really um it's 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 becoming more and more profound as this research moves forward, um, but you know a whole generation of southern, um, what we now think of as country musicians were steeped in Hawaiian string band music. Mother Maybell Carter played the Hawaiian steel guitar. Uh, Bill Monroe, in some interviews with Mike Seeger, talked about his earliest memories in Rosine, Kentucky, of a Hawaiian steel guitar player who was taking a Sears and Roebuck mail order Hawaiian guitar course. Um, and of course, Jimmy Rogers, before he was the singing break man, was wearing a lei and a sash and singing in a, a Hawaiian uh, vaudeville show kind of tour. So it, the effect is really pretty pronounced. And of course, as you're saying, on the African-American uh, blues slide tradition. Um, yeah. Oh, the dreadnought, right. Yeah, so Martin builds uh, this special model for Ditson and really not sure what they want to call it. Uh, so Frank Henry Martin sees the HMS Dreadnought from the British Navy and it had been around for about a decade and saw that was the largest warship at the time and since his company was building the largest guitar at the time he decided to borrow the name of the ship for the guitar and I mean every time you see a D, a D28, a D35, D18 that D stands for Dreadnought and it comes from those famous World War I battleships. The biggest, baddest battleship of World War I. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty intense. I, that dreadnought term, um, you know, I think it, it applied to a lot of different things that were really large and powerful at the time. Um, I've heard it mentioned that you could refer to automobile tires if they were big and powerful as dreadnoughts. Mm -hmm. or, um, but yeah, definitely that, that battleship is a name that carries a lot of weight. So we see the first dreadnought sail to the Ditson Company on August 9th of 1916. And Martin had been building special instruments for Ditson, ukuleles and guitars, and they had this uh, different shape with a very wide waist. And so when they decided to build the dreadnought based off of the drawings for the Kealakai model, they gave it that wide-waisted shape instead of the more narrow waist like on a triple O or a double O. Right, and, and you know, Ditson already had a line of guitars, uh, standard and concert guitars that were that were selling well. And I think that to keep this uh, jumbo model in line with that, they made the waist um, match. And you know, the ukuleles from this period too are, are very collectible now. The, the dreadnought um, ukuleles, and they do sound they do sound a little stronger by most collectors' um, opinion. So that the. Uh... The most famous of the Ditson models, the Dreadnoughts, was the Ditson 111. And you see right. one on the screen. You can see behind me our 1929 Ditson 111 from our museum collection. Now, originally, the first few years, they were fan-braced. That, I'm not quite sure why the company decided to fan-brace uh, a steel string guitar. But they were discontinued for a little while. Harry Hunt asked Martin to reissue them in 1923. And then the models you see built between 1923 and 1929 are X-braced. Right. But then we see Ditson go out of business. And so Martin decides, what should we do with this extra large uh, bass guitar, as it was referred to at the time? Hmm. Uh, they had another customer in Chicago, the Chicago Musical Instrument Company. Right. And at that time there was the WLS radio station that uh, had been hosting the National Barn Dance radio show. And so they had some performers very interested in the Dreadnought model. So they started purchasing what was the D1 and the D2 
from Martin, and then eventually Martin started selling uh, the D18 and the D28. Some of the famous artists at the time, there was Arky, the Arkansas woodchopper from Chicago. Uh, he was on WLS. And then Gene Autry. Uh, here we see on the, on the screen the first D28, which is another guitar that's also behind me, part of our museum collection. Uh, a guitar that was once in the collection of the actor Richard Gere. Mm. Yeah, once once Gene Autry picked up that that dreadnought, uh, I think everybody who wanted to be any kind of country western singer, that was the guitar they had to have, right? And I exactly, love, um, I love the detail of you know when you really made it in in show business, you had your name inlaid inlaid in mother of pearl <laughs> right down the fingerboard. Exactly. There's a great letter from Mother Maybell Carter to the Martin Company in the archives where she's ordering a new Hawaiian style steel guitar and she wants her name inlaid down the fingerboard. <laughs> I don't know if that guitar ever got made. Uh, I don't believe so. But what really made the Dreadnought models take off was in 1934 when Martin switched to the 14 fret design. And right. that's when you see the early country music scene. You know, radio was king at the time. And there's so many photos in the archives of musicians on promotional postcards that they would send out to their fans posing with their Martin Dreadnoughts. Yeah. And then from there, you just see it kick off. I mean, Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, you can go on and on. Paul McCartney, Kurt Cobain, Tony Rice, yeah. uh, Jim Croce. There's so many artists, Joni Mitchell, you know, so many artists that have played a Martin Dreadnought throughout the history of music. It is really the quintessential guitar, whether you're playing country, bluegrass, rock. Even recently learned Steve Jones uh, mm -hmm. was a big fan of Martin guitar. So punk musicians play Martins. They're Neil Young. I mean, you can go on and on. And we could talk for hours just about all of the musicians that have played Martins, uh, the Martin Dreadnought. But we have a yeah. couple minutes left here, so let's get to some uh, questions that have been submitted. Okay. Uh, so the question is, can you please tell us what are the main differences between the first Dreadnought model and the actual ones? Uh, so I think that's kind of referring to the initial Dreadnought that Martin built for Ditson, that those early uh, D-111s and uh, the D-222 mm -hmm. that were you know, fan brace, pretty... Uh, pretty light when it came to appointments, just some simple binding. And then you get on to when Martin starts building the Dreadnought under their own name with the D18 and the D28, where it gets the famous herringbone inlay and the diamond and squares uh, fingerboard inlay. And then eventually the first D45 for Gene Autry with all of the pearl. Right. Uh, next we have, what is our most popular Dreadnought model? Well, even though its list price is over $3,000. The D28 is our most popular Dreadnought model. I mean, we've been building it since 1931, and so many famous musicians have played it, and the reason for that is not just because it says Martin on it, it's because how great the guitar sounds and, and just the quality of the D28. Absolutely, uh, it's a powerful, powerful sound. Next question is, and I'll say this exactly how it shows up here. Can you all please talk about the special bridge, the lap slide versus standard style of Kialakai? You know, that's so, an interesting... Sorry, go ahead, Jason. Well, my theory on the bridge was to combat the tension of steel strings. And I think Martin uh, kind of took that design and uh, they thought about that when they introduced the belly bridge in mm -hmm. 1930. And so yeah. with Kialakai, he had that special oversized bridge. And I just think, you know, it was there to help reinforce the top from the, the, the pressure, the pull that steel strings puts on it. Yeah, you know, those early, those early um, pioneers of the Hawaiian steel guitar style, Joseph Kekuku and Mikia Kalakai, they were hunting up the loudest strings they could find. And often they were pulling strings out of pianos and putting them on those early guitars. That 0030 Mikia was playing was actually built for uh, nylon, you know, gut strings. And so I think the bridge tore up and they, they came up with a bigger footprint. But that bridge design actually kind of harkens back to some of the instruments that were um, being played by the royal family here in Hawaii that have that sort of botanical motif incorporated into them. 
Um, and there's actually a, a, a tracing of that in the Martin archives from 1916 from Nakia. Well, I want to thank everybody for watching today and thank you, Kylan, Kylan for uh, giving us all of that great knowledge that you've uncovered recently. Thanks, Jason. It's been an honor to be here.